everybody and welcome back to a couple bucks this is couple as per usual today we're going to be doing a series review that's where i've been if you've been wondering where i've been i've been reading two series as of late one series i'm going to hold off on telling you guys about until i am done with it i'm almost done but this is the series i just finished it is six books written by michael j sullivan and the name of the series is called the legends of the first empire these consist of six books age of myth age of swords age of war Age of Legends, Death, and Empire. And this is its standalone series, although it is also the prequel series to the Ryaria Chronicles and Revelation series by Michael J. Sullivan, where we see Royce and Hadrian taking on their various adventures. You guys, I'm sure you guys have heard me talk about Royce and Hadrian. I love them. Best romance and fantasy at the moment, at least I, in my opinion. I love their... I love their interplay, I love the dialogue, I love everything about that series. But, we're not here to discuss Ryaria. We are here to discuss its prequel series, The Eight, the Legends of the First Empire. This takes place 3,000 years prior, although it is basically its own standalone series. You can read this completely on its own and not, ha not have ever even touched or looked at any of the Ryaria books and you would be just fine. Although if you have read the Ryaria books, you're going to really enjoy the series even more because it's going to basically give you all the hints and tidbits of factoids and information that we as book lovers love to see happen. We're going to basically actually live the legends that are being told in the Ryaria series. But because it's its own series and its own standalone series, let alone, I'm going to appreciate it as that and give you guys a spoiler free review right now on what is this series about. And then we will move, be moving into some spoilerish um, final thoughts uh, since I've concluded the series, but I'll be giving you a forewarning. I promise you. So to begin, well, let me tell you a little bit of the lay of the land. So humans, also known as runes in this story, basically live at the bottom half of this continent, while Frey, also known as elves, live at the top half of this continent. But since majority of the story deals with the human perspective, I'm going to stick with the runes to start off with. The runes once again, also known as humans, basically is spread out throughout the bottom in different types of clan-like settings. They're known as dolls in the story. And our primary doll that we're going to be working with, at least in the beginning, is going to be Doll Wren, Clan Wren. Clan Wren is led by the chieftain and his wife, who I believe is the main character, at least initially, and that is Persephone. Persephone assists her husband in ruling wisely and making sure that they deal with all the types of problems that any type of clan would face in basically the Stone Age. They have to make sure there's enough food in the village stores for winter. They have to make sure that they're going to be able to survive winter. They need to ensure that their people are happy and safe. That is Persephone's main job. She makes she steers her husband in the right direction since once again this is the Stone Age and female leadership is not exactly the standard of society at this point. So Persephone helps her husband rule quite strongly and make sure everything goes well in the clan. She also has her ragtag group of people that we're going to meet throughout our story, who I'm just going to introduce you to my, some of my favorites right now. We have my personal favorite, Roan. Roan is a super quiet, super, like, oh, she's such she's such a sweet soul. This um, girl who, due to her rough past, which I'll let you guys learn as you guys read the story, is basically kind of become very introverted and very stays pretty much in her own head most of the time. Although she also happens to be an extreme genius, like the, literally the Albert Einstein of this time period and this is the stone age so she's going to come up with pretty exciting things that we are all going to be very anxious for people to get their hands on we also follow my second favorite character probably gifford gifford is the pottery um maker of the clan and also is world renowned or as much as i can say world renowned he is human rune renowned for his pottery making because it's so exquisite and intricate um, unfortunately though he was born disabled, extremely disabled. He has a back disability or back deformity and legs deformity that make his life very difficult. Um, his mother also died in childbirth and his father died shortly after me. He's had a very rough go of it as well. We then have Moya. Moya is basically the village free thinker. She is basically your first feminist. Um, she kind of wants to live her own independent life, how she wants to live it, and doesn't want to listen to anyone else. Many people look down on her for this, unfortunately, though. We then proceed with our next character, Pedra. Pedra is basically the village wise woman. She's super smart, super wise, mostly because she's ancient. And she says that she's been around since basically humans began to exist. Like this woman has been around forever. And she's also fantastic and also happens to be basically the closest thing to a healer in the village. And then lastly, our next 
kind of second main secondary character that we're going to meet in Clan Ren is going to be Bryn. Bryn is training currently to become the next storyteller of the village. What is a storyteller? Well, they haven't invented history books quite yet. So literally, they have to memorize everything through verbatim like storytelling and that's how they learn their stories and that's how they keep track of their history and Bryn is training to become the next one for the clan of Ren to basically catalog all of their stories and all of their history inside her own head through the telling of stories and that's basically clan Ren and these groups of people are going to deal with various challenges as they enter but I'm going to wait to tell you what's really going on and what their main challenges that they're facing until after I tell you a little bit about the next clan Clan Durian or or Dal Durian. Durian is basically unlike Clan Ren. They live in a they live a much harder lifestyle. It's constant war time with them as they do as they fight with other runes in the area, and they live in a very stony terrain, making wood a luxury, and therefore heating or any kind of cooking also a luxury. It's a very hard life that they live. Our main character from Clan Durian is Wraith, and he's pretty much the only guy you're going to meet from Clan Durian. But Dur Wraith and his father are currently traveling and they are hunting because like I said it's a very hard life that they live so they have they're gonna hunt for their food they find a I think a deer and they end up following it into a forbidden land what is this land well that's where the fray also known as the elves come into the story the elves who live above the humans uh, the love uh, live above the humans both physically as in, uh, in the top or part of the continent and also pretty much in every other way you can think of, they basically rule the runes and make sure that the runes don't go out of their areas and basically keep the runes crammed down and make sure they stay in the Stone Age while the elves continue to flourish in their era of peace and prosperity. And the elves have basically forbidden any humans to enter into their lands at all. And the punishment is death, like literally they just will kill you. And Wraith and his father end up getting caught across the river and they end up getting caught by a elf, a fray who is currently being followed by two of his human servants, for lack of a better word, or human slaves is probably a better, more accurate term. And the father tries to reason with him, but the elf decides that, that the punishment needs to be dealt with, and the elf comes and kills the father after a brief fight with the father, and then comes for Wraith himself. However, Wraith ends up surviving this encounter and I'll let you figure out how that happens and he ends up gaining the name God Killer because he killed a Frey which are literally basically worshipped as godlike creatures by the humans of this world. They literally view the Frey since due to their longevity of life and everything they base and because of the supposed magic that the elves possess the humans literally see them as gods or as close as. Wraith therefore gains the title of God Killer. And Wraith then flees from the area, taking with him one of the human slaves that was along that was with the fray. And they escape into the wilderness. And that's basically where we take center stage. That's basically where our story begins. You have the humans, the runes, and the Freys living in semi-coexistence, but that's pretty much only because the Freys continue to push down the humans and make sure that they stay in the Stone Age and don't let them advance too much and make sure that they keep their po populations lo low and making sure that they stay within their allow allotted places or allotted spaces if that makes sense but because of Wraith's actions at the beginning of the book Wraith broke a sacred law basically first of all he killed a fray which no no oh god no god please no 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 like first of all it was not thought possible and second of all no no and then also that's like that's like the major crime and the minor one was the fact that he went into their lands like he like really just broke a crap ton of laws like Wraith screwed up and his father screwed up big time bad no bad no no like this is not going to be a slap on the wrist kind of thing and so the fray now takes center stage the fray currently are living in a time of peace and coexistence and i don't mean coexistence with humans i mean coexistence with each other after long thousands of years of feuding between the different tribes of the fray they end up being banned together a few like two or three um like a few thousand years ago they all end up uniting under one ruler and this one ruler the fane of the um elves basically rules and they are currently ruled by one tribe at the time and this one tribe is basically the magical tribe of the elves meaning that this tribe is able to perform magic unlike the other tribes and they use 
their superiority granted to them by their ability to use magic to basically maintain control. But while they do this, the elves still remain in peace and it's still like a time of prosperity for them compared to the humans. But as soon as Wraith ends up killing this elf, he sets off a chain of events that are gonna lead to the elves deciding that it's time to basically push back on the humans and make sure that they know who's the boss. And that's basically where we start the story. As Persephone and Clanran and basically all of the runes, i.e. humans of the world, basically deal with the fact that the fray are now coming for them. The beings that they once thought were gods are now coming to slaughter all of them. And that's basically the story. And if that sounds intriguing to you, then I highly suggest picking it up. Now, if you're not already looking into this series, let me tell you a little bit what's going on. The reasons I love this, this series is not really because of the actual story, if that makes sense. <laughs> this is probably one of the top two or three series of all time in terms of characters. Like, the characters are really tangible beings, and you care about them deeply, and you really care about them. Like, you love them and you like really care for what's going to happen to them and what they're going to do and how these actions are going to like affect them. And I have not felt so strongly towards characters before in a very long time. Like it's been a long time. Like this is a character centered story line. If you've ever wanted a prime example of one you follow and these, and these aren't just like your standard hero types. These are not, you know, young boy taken from a village becomes a grand hero or superpower or sorcerer in a secret who doesn't even know his own powers or someone who was hidden away at his birth to protect himself and then ends up finding out he's just like he's the heir to the throne like it's none of that this is a ragtag group of people who are just trying to survive as the fray the elves come to slaughter them all and they deal with it all very differently and it's a grand story and it's not just that's not the entire series it it, it transforms it goes from uh, this, it, get, it goes from Frey trying to slaughter us all very differently than something else. I'm going to let you figure that out because I don't want to spoil the series for you guys. But it really is a, you're literally seeing a grand period of time. Like, you know, we talk about often how like history will remember us and how we will be remembered. And we think back to moments like we just went through Corona where it's like, that's going to go down in history books. And kids 50 years from now are going to be like, what was Corona like? And we're going to be able to tell them about the Zoom classes and everything and how insane it was like we lived history for a moment and we still are living history today this is literally watching people live history and create history before your eyes of course it's in a fictional world with elves and humans and dwarves but nonetheless i think the fact remains true that like you're watching history take place on a level i've really not seen in a while um in terms of its grandiosity like what they do in these books are going to impact this world obviously thousands of years later as depicted in the Ryaria Chronicles and Revelation series by Michael J. Sullivan. Like, it really is just grand. And I loved it for its scope. I loved it for its character building that Michael J. Sullivan does. The world building, of course, is fantastic. There's so many moving pieces within the story that Michael J. Sullivan is able to balance that it doesn't feel overwhelming, yet it's constantly refreshing. So every time you turn to a new perspective, there's something fresh going on, and it's not the constant monotonous repeating of what is going on in the world, and then just dealing it from different perspectives every different perspective has its own problems that it's dealing with and they each are handling them uniquely and it feels very fresh like i feel like i'm reading three different stories within one and it all ties together seamlessly at the end of the series so i have to say it's probably one of my all-time like top 10 for sure favorite series of all time especially in the epic fantasy genre all right so that's pretty much the spoiler free version of it and looking at the time i'm probably gonna have to give a spoiler filled review of this series because I don't want to keep you guys here forever. So let me guys know what your guys' thoughts are down below. I don't know if I even covered everything I wanted to cover. It's just, there's so much going on in this series. It's hard to put into words exactly what I loved about it, but I feel like I tried to get across to you what the story is and how I felt about it. So let me know what your guys' thoughts are. If you guys are interested, if I did a decent job on explaining such a grand tale, so I, I think it's one of my first times describing an entire series. So let me know what your guys' thoughts are down below. And be sure to hit the like and subscribe button while you're down there if you wouldn't mind doing so. And I'll be seeing you guys in the next video. Bye now.